Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome to the stage Suzanne Wilson Heckenberg, Chief Operating Officer at the Intelligence and National Security Alliance. Welcome back. Before we get to the closing plenary of the day, I just wanted to point out that I've noticed a lot of young professionals throughout the exhibit hall and the plenaries and the panels yesterday and today. And along that vein, I would encourage all the young professionals here today, as well as some of you more mature folks in the room, um, to stop by the National Pastime Bar and Grill at the conclusion of the program. The Intelligence Champions Council at INSA and FCA's Emerging Professionals and Intelligence Committee will be hosting this happy hour this evening. Year over year, the senior most leaders in our community see the summit as the forum to share strategic insights and their, with their most critical partners. This year has been no exception. We have a truly all-star lineup to close out today's program. To get us started, please welcome to the stage Kent Matlick, Senior Vice President and General Manager of Perspectives Intelligence Group. He will introduce our moderator. Kent, over to you. Thank you. As uh, Suzanne mentioned, I'm Kent Matlick. As I'll step up here, it might be a little taller. Um, and I'm the uh, Senior Vice President and General Manager for the Intelligence Group at uh, Perspecta. Um, Perspecta has been around about a, a year, but we've been working with the intelligence community for almost 50 years. Uh, and we're proud to be partnering with INSA and AFSIA uh, at this year's Intel Summit. Uh, I'm honored to introduce the moderator for the final plenary uh, on strategic threats and national collection priorities, David Ignatius. Uh, David is a prize-winning columnist and associate editor for the Washington Post. His twice-weekly globally distributed column focuses on global politics, economics, and international affairs. In his over 30 years with the Washington Post, he's covered much of Washington, including the Pentagon, the CIA, Capitol Hill Cyber Command. Turning his experiences with the CIA to, into 10 spy novels, David has been praised for his unparalleled understanding of the intelligence world. His most recent high-tech spy thriller, The Quantum Spy, is about a covert race to build the world's first quantum computer, supercomputer. So with that, please welcome David Ignatius. Thank you. Kent, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I want to get right down to business and introduce our all-star panel. These are familiar faces to you, but I'm just going to briefly introduce first General Paul Nakasone, Director of the National Security Agency and also Head of Cyber Command. Uh, Dr. Christopher Scalise, who's Director of the National Reconnaissance Organization. Uh, uh, Lieutenant General Robert Ashley, Director of the Defense Intelligence Agency, Vice Admiral Robert Sharp, Director of the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency. Mr. Paul uh, Abate, who is Associate De Deputy Director of the FBI, responsible for the Bureau's personnel, budget, uh, administration, and infrastructure. Before we get started on our discussion, I was oh. talking backstage with General Nakasone, who has a special <coughs> few words he'd like to share. David, thank you very much. As fall marks a period of transition for many of us, it's also a period of transition for INSA as we get ready to uh, recognize Chuck Alsop for a distinguished career as both the president of INSA, but for his career in the Army and his career as a professional service member at, uh, staff member at the Senate Armed Service Committee. Chuck is getting ready to retire. And uh, I think on behalf of all of us who either work for Chuck, worked with Chuck, or have had the, the pleasure of just being around Chuck, thank you for a marvelous career, Chuck. So with that uh, opening, uh, congratulations. I, I want to ask uh, each member of our panel uh, the, the same baseline question. And I want to pose it this way. As we know, we have a national military strategy that has really <clears throat> tried to focus the United States, our intelligence uh, and defense uh, systems 
on the new reality of great power competition. Mm -hmm. At the same time, we have, as everyone in this audience knows, rapidly advancing changes in technology. So I want to ask each of you to begin by telling us a little bit about how those two challenges, mm -hmm. great power competition, you know, rapid onset of, of technology is affecting your agency. Joe Naksoni. Well, David, I begin with uh, really an idea of what's the opportunity uh, and what's the challenge in, in the, the environment that you describe. And I would use one word for both of them. It's talent. Our greatest opportunity is our greatest strength, which is our talent. Mm -hmm. The National Security Agency for over 67 years, it's a workforce that has been recruited, that has been trained, that has been retained to look at a changing atmosphere. And for us, that has been our power. Um, as we look, though, for this changing world, think about our challenge as well. Our challenge is in a period of increasing change, in a period of, period of increasing technological uh, advantage, how do we make sure that we retain that force? And more importantly, in this world, how do we ensure that we're able to recruit, train, and retain a force that is not only representative of our nation, but one that we can continue to compete with many of you in this room <clears throat> and other members of our government and even the services to make sure that we have that world-class talent. Dr. Scalise. I would second the, the talent, but I would also add that as an opportunity, one of the things we have is our partnerships, our strong partnerships among <laughs> the organizations that are, are sitting up here in front of you, but also all of the, the organizations that we deal with. Uh, the industry, which is providing you know, new technologies, new capabilities that we can certainly take advantage of to improve our resiliency, uh, advance our technology, um, reduce our costs, uh, and allow us to stay ahead of, of those who, uh, who are trying to get ahead of us. Uh, at the same time, we have new, new capabilities and new, new partnerships to be formed with the uh, creation of the uh, U.S. Space Command now. Uh, we have a, a great partner paying attention to space, which is something that, that's becoming a, a much more critical aspect of our, our defense and inter intelligence posture. Uh, and working with them and developing partnerships like at the National Space Defense Center uh, is absolutely critical. So I would add that in order to, to stay ahead and to address those challenges that you mentioned, uh, it's talent and our partnerships that will really allow us to do that. General Ashley. So let me add uh, to what they've said. The good thing is, absolutely agree, but let me add machine analytics. Mm -hmm. so one of the big challenges and one of the opportunities we have is our ability to deal with big data at scale. And the problems of great peer competition means that you're not into a region, you're not into Indo-PACOM, or you're not into uh, UCOM. It is a global challenge. So from a machine analytics standpoint, how do we harness the insights and the aggregation of big data and apply analytics to be able to get that kind of indications and warning to get those insights that you might not see mm -hmm. when the information is disaggregated. And then the other part you know, that's integral to everything that we do is providing decision advantage to senior leaders. And it's that understanding of the aggregation of that information, applying the analytics that, that helps you get those insights. So that's one of the opportunities the other part of that is you really have to layer that with classified collection, because I think that is, for me, that's kind of the secret sauce of there's public available, you know, big data information, and then that is kind of integrated with the pristine collection that you get from the intelligence community. And then the other part of that in terms of thinking of, you know, we say, okay, there's an opportunity. Well, here's the challenge. The challenge is understanding what's behind the machine analytics. Mm -hmm. One of the great things that we do when we talk about talent in the workforce is analysis. So for the Defense Intelligence Agency, it is all sorts analysis. So I am a huge advocate of everybody sitting up here getting well-funded because they feed the Defense Intelligence Agency. But from a tradecraft standpoint, it's important that I know what's behind that analysis. So some of the work that we do now with um, algorithms, machine learning, we've got to be able to keep the trust that we built in our senior leaders by being able to help them understand what underpins that information. And what we're doing right now is we're applying the normal tradecraft that an analyst would use in writing uh, a piece of analysis to how we're looking at machine learning. 
So for us to keep that trust and be able to leverage big data analytics, we've got to understand what's inside the machine that puts that together mm -hmm. and build it in such a way that we're leveraging Tradecraft. Admiral Sharp. Yeah, let me, let me uh, continue to build on the kind of the theme and the thread coming through here. One thing I'd tell you is, um, although this is new, this isn't new for us. Um, I spoke last month at uh, INSA dinner event, and I started off by saying, here, let me frame the problem for you. We're in great power competition. We have competitors that are designing, um, fielding weapon systems um, designed to do us harm, to defeat our ability to know where and how they operate, to defeat our ability to defend against them. Uh, at the same time, we're facing this, this um, new sources of information that are coming at us. We need to um, um, reimagine our workflows. We need to rethink how we're doing our IT modernization, uh, our, our infrastructure. We need to think through what are the skill sets that we have. Um, all things that a guy named Ray Hofstetler was dealing with back in 1984 as he was becoming the director of the National Photographic Interpretation Center. And we found ourselves in this transition period from going of wet film processing, space-based wet film processing, digital technology coming online, um, you know, which was bringing new sources of data. And uh, what I told the group there and, and uh, what, what we're dealing with now is that's both opportunity for us, you know, challenge for us and an opportunity for us. Um, and the way we were successful back in the 80s, when we were in that sort of competition, faced with that new technology, uh, you know, the way we were successful um, goes back to what was being highlighted here. It was because we had the best people um, and the best partners. And we empowered those individuals. Um, and we, we told them, here's the challenges we we're facing. We don't know how we're going to get there, but we need to get there. And we gave them the resources. We stayed out of their way, and we were successful. So I think we're really kind of at one of those inflection points right now, which is why you, you see us all emphasizing the strength of us being our people and our partnerships. And those partnerships um, were really broadly defined, you know, only limited by our imaginations and our willingness to go out and create meaningful connections, which is why the, uh, you know, forums like this are really so important uh, to us and so important to the nation. Mr. Bate. I'm going to further double down on what, what's already been said. It's the people and the partnerships, but to bring a greater focus to it, it's really the interwoven fabric of, our, of all of our organizations and the way we work together, which goes back to the people and the partnerships. You know, we in the FBI have an incredibly talented, creative, ambitious, dri mission-driven workforce, um, true patriots with a passion for protecting our great country and the American people. And that's what we all have across all of these great organizations. And we get to see it coming together each and every day at the national level and across the field and around the world as well. Literally, we're working side by side. Our, our people are better than ever, closer than ever to address the threats that are coming at us and leverage that technology um, to meet those challenges as we move forward. I'll leave it at that. So I want to bring this discussion uh, down from the 30,000 foot level to the kinds of, of problems in which you're all engaged. And General Nakasone, I want to start with, with you. Uh, each member of the panel talked about partnerships. We so often hear discussions of whole of government approaches. It's almost a mantra. Uh, but you uh, lived through a pretty interesting experience with that in trying to safeguard the 2018 midterm elections, both in your mm -hmm. NSA Cyber Command partnership and also working with the FBI and other agencies. Maybe you could just walk the audience through the basics of how that worked, how the interagency process, you know, we love to celebrate, but it often is an obstacle to that kind of cooperation, uh, not a facilitator. So when we uh, thought about the elections for 2018, um, last summer one of the things that we immediately did is we went back and we took a look at 2016 and thoroughly understood our adversary. And whether or not that was on the National Security Agency side or the U.S. Cybercom side, what we knew coming out of that is we had to do something different. What was that different thing that we did? It was really three parts. First of all, we said we're going to make sure that any adversary has um, no opportunity to get to our election infrastructure. 
And so working very, very closely by, with, and through the Department of Homeland Security, share as much intelligence as we had with regards to what our adversary might do. The second thing we said is we know that influence operations can be very, very harmful for our nation. And we had seen that adversaries had tried to play off both sides of an issue. You know, it was very great timing here in the Federal Bureau investigation and the Department of Justice stood up the Foreign Influence Task Force. So working with the Foreign Influence Task Force, again, sharing all the information that we had, we said, hey, this is what our adversaries might do. And FBI was incredibly powerful in working with social media companies to alert them to the tradecraft, the tactics, the procedures that our adversaries were able to uh, encounter and, and do before. And the final thing we said is, if there is an adversary or adversaries that are attempting to either influence or interfere in our elections, we're going to take them on. We're going to impose costs on the adversary. So we deployed teams to find those adversaries' malware. Uh, we work with and through the government and the interagency to figure out what are the authorities that we needed. And we were able in 2018, in this whole of government uh, effort, I would say, to deliver a safe and secure election, one that uh, I would say uh, is reflective of the power of all of our agencies, but very, very reflective of really the power of our talent. Mm -hmm. I wrote recently about this effort, and I, one of the things I noted with interest was that as you deployed your forward teams uh, in this run-up to the 2018 elections, you were able to gather uh, samples <clears throat> of Russian malware uh, in Ukraine, uh, Macedonia, other places, and then post them publicly uh, on a website so uh, the community uh, of cybersecurity professionals could, could take them down. I want to ask Mr. Abate, because you were, in a sense, the other side of this partnership, about what it's been like working for the FBI, working with state and local uh, authorities in our country, famously. Elections are a matter for states and localities. How's that going in terms of your ability to easily interface uh, with the authorities that actually have to run elections? The, uh, the positive thing here is we've learned a lot of hard lessons from our mistakes uh, back in 2016. Um, we've come together, as the general stated, across government and at all levels, federal, state, and local, and with the private sector, importantly, as well, um, in ways that we probably couldn't have imagined even uh, you know, two or three years ago. Um, it's working really well, the level of information and intelligence sharing with uh, state and local officials, uh, staying ahead of the threat, not after something's already uh, has occurred, is uh, been an incredible shift to go left of the threat and get as much intelligence out there to inform them and put them in the best position to protect themselves in the, in the election infrastructure. And then what's very encouraging is um, the gap we've closed significantly with, um, again, as the general mentioned, private sector social media companies, the level of sharing that's occurring there now and has, uh, most recently, 2018, um, is incredible. Really, really positive, and it goes both ways. Uh, we're pushing information and intelligence out to the companies to help them spot bad actors on their platforms and remove them, and they're giving information back to us to inform our efforts. So again, as the general mentioned, we can aggressively go out and take action against them and cut them off at the knees. So uh, I want to ask uh, General Ashley if he'd address in a little bit more granularity the nature of the near-peer competitor that we're now focusing on increasingly, and that's <clears throat> China. I've heard it said that the United States really has never faced an adversary quite like China, potential adversary, uh, in that this is uh, economically powerful, tech technologically advanced, a genuine competitor at all levels. And I want to ask you, from your perspective at DIA, uh, looking at, at all the uh, material that you, that you do, how you would characterize China, China's buildup, uh, what aspects of its technological development particularly mm -hmm. concern you uh, from your vantage? So, so let me put it in a framing document, if I could, first. So the national defense strategy. And the central problem of the national defense strategy is our military advantages being eroded and what we're seeing in the development of weapon systems and capabilities by the Chinese. 
that national defense strategy is broken out into three major lines of effort. How do we become more lethal? How do we expand our allies and partners and how we become more efficient in how we operate? What's really changed is the character of war over time. Mm -hmm. And for us specifically, if I think about the last 17 years and deployments in Iraq and Afghanistan and the different domains in which we operate, cyber, space, maritime, land, sea, really the only domain that's been contested is a land domain. You think about IEDs and the attacks and you had another one in, that took place in Kabul today. So now we have the reemergence of great power competition that can challenge the U.S. in all of those war fighting domains. And then you have the changes in the character of war with different technologies that are coming aboard. You've written about quantum, hypersonics, cyber, what General Nakasone has to face, which is instantaneous real time on a global scale. But there's a couple of tiers of this and you alluded to it. So at the Defense Intelligence Agency, my responsibility is the M and dime. But I can't ignore the other three instruments of power. And so when we go and we talk to the chairman, Trey Whitworth, Admiral Whitworth, the Joint Staff J2, has a conversation with the chairman, you know, he's going to heavily focus on the military piece of that, but it will be informed by the other instruments of power. Because something that may happen diplomatically or economically as China reaches out into Africa, other regions, and Djibouti is one of the best examples, where they may go diplomatically or economically is an indication warning of where they may end up militarily. So the initial discussions, I would uh, suspect to say, with the Djiboutians uh, were not about having a military base in proximity to a port in the Bab el-Mandeb. It was about having an economic relationship, loans, et cetera. And then that builds over time. So what we have to do is pay close attention to the Belt and Road Initiative and what the potentiality is of an expansion of China in many ways to be more like the United States as a global power in realizing that their role as a potential future global power, although regional, regionally focused now, uh, is the ability to project power militarily and to protect their economic interests. So I want to ask uh, Dr. Scalise and Admiral Sharp, whose agencies are so focused mm -hmm. on uh, overhead uh, collection, mm -hmm. uh, about the new world that we're all trying to figure out, and that's the world in which there's going to be a space command, uh, exactly how that's going to interface uh, even uh, with other parts of the, the DOD is not entirely uh, clear yet. But I want to ask you if you would address uh, the challenge of space and the potential uh, problems with so many people now wanting to, to focus on it. Uh, it's, it's something that people like me have begun to write about, but our ability to project power around the world is entirely dependent today, I think still, on our ability to use space-based assets mm -hmm. that we increasingly understand are vulnerable. So maybe each of you could speak a little bit about, about, about the <clears throat> new world of space command slash space force, how you're going to deal with it, how your lives will be different, if at all, and then uh, Admiral Sharp. Do you want me to start? Sure. Uh, uh, let me start by saying uh, we're already working very closely with Space Command as it, as it uh, becomes what it's going to be for the nation. So with uh, you know, our workforce, National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, um, about half of our workforce works from Springfield here in, in uh, Virginia. About 25% uh, works out in St. Louis, com uh, commands that we have out there. And the other 25% is globally dispersed. Uh, and we have uh, NGA members embedded in departments and agencies in all the combatant commands and in all the combat zones. And it's, it's, uh, it's a strength of our agency that it's very connected and collaborative by nature. I mention this because we've already stood up, you know, a support team for Spacecom well, where we were establishing co-location with them so that um, just like with the other combatant commands, we can be in their battle rhythm, we can be in their meetings, we can hear what the commander's requirements are, and we can make sure that we are meeting his requirements. That's part of our, our approach towards this. Um, getting back to your, your question on space-based sensing, also, we don't solely rely on space-based sensing to do our job. There's a whole big foundational aspect of knowing the earth and understanding the world that comes from 
uh, all kinds of different ways of, of sensing and bringing in sources of data. Um, but but we, uh, we do certainly benefit from great capabilities that are in space. Some of those are US government uh, designed, owned, and, and operated. Um, some of those increasingly are um, commercial capabilities. Some of those are increasingly also um, investments that our international partners are making, have made, are making, are anticipating making. Um, and we, we view that as an opportunity. We view that as additional sources that can answer the myriad uh, questions that we get from senior policy makers to Pentagon decision makers to the operational or the tactical level to first responders. You know, one of the things we we're dealing with today is, is uh, Dorian and the effects uh, on the Bahamas down there, you know, and how can we tap into the full range of sources or capabilities that are out there so that we can provide whole of government uh, non-government organizations, whoever is going to be responding there, um, better awareness as to what it looked like before, what it looks like now. Um, so that's part of that um, tension on figuring out how we're going to do business in the future. Um, we, we don't view that as a competition of sources. We, we view that as an opportunity to be smarter about how we do business. And uh, I was mentioning to you before that at the GeoInt Symposium I was discussing, I just want to know what I need to know when I need to know it. Um, and I want to do so um, smartly with, as a good steward of the U.S. Tax, taxpayer dollar. So I've been saying I, I, I want omniscience on demand. I don't know what, what that is, but I think I want that's it. A, that's a modest request. <laughs> it's a modest proposal. Um, but I, I think what we're doing in space is going to be uh, uh, critical to success in the future. Let me turn this to, to Dr. Scalise and just focus on one issue that um, I wrote a little bit about a few, a few months ago. There are some who think that um, we really do need to consolidate our space-based uh, assets planning, um, the, both the intelligence and, uh, and, and military sides of that. Um, and, and who worry about having multiple uh, space-oriented stovepipes. That's historically a real problem in our country. We have these magnificent but separate pipes. And so I want to ask you uh, at NRO how you're thinking about working with Space Command, what you see as the particular mm -hmm. challenges. Um, I assume that you want to see NRO remain separate, uh, but uh, just make the, the argument why you know, if, if somebody from the White House walked into the room and said, why shouldn't it all be combined? And what, what's the answer to that? First, I would say that, you know, the, the creation of Space Command and, and the discussion and, and, and hopefully the creation of the Space Force is an indication of how important this nation now considers space and, and space assets. Uh, NRO plays, a, you know, an extremely critical role in providing uh, information as both a defense agency and as an intelligence uh, agency to, to be able to pr support the national uh, needs for, for data to the uh, intelligence analyst as well as, as the warfighter. And we need to, to uh, preserve that type of a capability. Working with Space Command actually enhances the role of the NRO because we, we now recognize that space is a warfighting domain. Uh, in order to provide the resiliency, the assurances that the overhead intelligence is going to be coming down. We have to have the ability to protect and defend our assets, both those that the NRO owns, the ones that, uh, that we work with, the commercial, um, as well as other assets. And we've been working with Space Command, uh, for, actually before Space Command was set up as Air Force Space Command, the National Space and Defense Center where we're trying to develop the strategies and how are we going to operate in a crisis or conflict situation so that we do have the unity of effort that the government needs to protect these critical assets that everybody is relying on. So I see it as, as really a, a, a force multiplier, obviously. You know, Space Command is, gonna, is, a, is a, a wonderful institution to have for the country right now uh, and going forward. Uh, we are going to work with them, and we have been working very closely. Uh, I think it's probably uh, one of the best partnerships that I've seen in the space industry, in the space uh, business. 
So I, I expect that to go forward and we're going to find ways as we work together and develop the, the, uh, the courses of action that we need to take under various situations. Uh, will inform that and just make the situation better. If I could add just a little bit to that, and General Nakasone has lived this probably more than anybody else, but if you go back 2013, 2014, there was the discussion of building a cyber MOS within the Army. And there was, there was pushback between the signal and the MI community because we saw we had equities in both sides of that camp, and we would lose force structure as you started to build this kind of capability. But I think as we look back, and it was really General Odierno as the chief at the time, said, no, I, we got to build a cyber capability. And it's that laser focus of building that that kind of led to our Army cyber and the capabilities that we have now. So I think that's an illustrative example of the need to have that kind of attention to build a space command, to have that kind of a focus giving where that lies as an enabler for us. And for the Defense Intelligence Agency, that's yet another layer uh, as we look at how we do foundational intelligence and how the enemy is going to fight, that we've got to be able to build for the warfighter. So, uh, as I hope you know, it's uh, <clears throat> possible for you to send questions uh, electronically to me, and we, we have several that I, I'm going to turn to. Um, uh, the attention of our European friends and allies has been focused uh, so intensely uh, in recent weeks, months on Brexit and the consequence. So we have two good questions from the audience about Brexit, and I might turn these over to, to, uh, to General Ashley and, and uh, General Naxoni <laughs> to get started, um, and you can hand them off to anyone <laughs> that, uh, that, you, that you want. But, but the first is, uh, Russia is clearly interested in undermining European unity. Does the intelligence community believe Russia influenced the UK Brexit vote? If so, how did the Russians operate and what impact did its mm. efforts have? General Nakhsoni, you spent so much time with your Russia small group. They did fabulous work. What, how would you answer that? I, I think it's important to, to consider the environment upon which our adversaries operate today. And that's an environment below the level of armed conflict. That's an ability to steal intellectual property. That's an ability to steal our personal information. It's also an attempt to, at times, uh, interfere in our democratic processes. We have to understand that. And uh, I, would, I would offer whether or not it's you know, the two plus three or others. This is the environment in which you're operating today, below the level of, our, of armed conflict. And so when we have responses to that, what we have to be able to do is certainly figure out how are we going to share the intelligence? How are we going to impose cost? How are we going to be able to assess the situation? And so that is, you know, from my perspective, among the most important things that we see in the changing environment today. So if you talk about is this in behind their strategy, absolutely. If they can see an opportunity to divide the West, that's where they're going to focus. But we talked about the nature and the character of war. The character of war is informed by changes in technology. So having a foreign government try to influence is nothing new. The, back in the days of the Soviets, actually all the way back to Lenin, the Bolshevik, not the Beatle, uh, you had a thing called reflexive control. Reflexive control is seeding information in such a way to drive you toward a decision, which is the outcome that they desire. Mm -hmm. It's information, it's influence, uh, it's deception. Th there's nothing new about this. What is, what is new is the means by which you can do it at scale and speed, whether it's bots, uh, pushing out CivCAS uh, on behalf of the Taliban to try to influence uh, the Afghan populace. So it's the means by which you can do it at scale, but that attempt to influence is nothing new. If I it's the weaponization one. of information. I mean, it's, you know, think about what we're seeing today in Hong Kong, the ability to take, you know, whether or not it's uh, cameras at every corner, whether or not it's the collection of data from personal cell phones that, uh, that uh, the Chinese are doing, but being able to weaponize that information is, as General Ashley points out, at a scale and a speed that is, is different than before. Uh, and it provides you know, authorita authoritarian regimes every single bit of um, impetus to be able to do that. Dave, I'll make sharp. one comment on this, not really uh, uh, from the influence aspect, but we were all stressing the, the, our strength being our people and our partnerships. I can tell you that regardless of, of how that, those discussions are going, um, there's been uh, no change whatsoever in the strength of our partnership. 
And each one of us, I know I, I do daily, I'm talking to my British counterparts along with Australians, New Zealand, Canadians, and we have them embedded within our force. Um, we like to say we not only have good friends, we have friends that are really good at what they do, and they bring tremendous capability and capacity. So, you know, as, uh, um, as they deal with Brexit, you know, and from a diplomatic, from a government perspective, I can tell you that, that uh, there's been no effect whatsoever in the way we cooperate military to military or intelligence to intelligence. And I'm sure law enforcement to law enforcement away, always. You, you all live in a five eyes world, uh, and that's obviously been enormously beneficial to the United States and to its partners. I always wonder, as a journalist who writes about this broad subject, whether other partnerships can be deepened. Mm -hmm. As we see Britain pull away from Europe, we realize we have some important partners and allies in Europe. Is our intelligence liaison with them everything that it could be? Are there ways uh, to, to deepen that? I, I, I'm just curious. Uh, w whether any of you would, would just uh, have something to, to say about, about that. So Beyond right. the Five Eyes world, yeah. how do we deepen additional partnerships? Uh, so I, if you go back to that second line of effort, the national defense strategy is expands, it's expand allies and partners, which means deepen those relationships at a classified level. And think about some non-traditional relationships. Multilateral is a little more problematic Bilateral is usually deeper, but the opportunities exist to build multilateral relationships. Mm -hmm. And rather than starting with a construct, which the Five Eyes is an incredibly strong relationship, um, I would tell you to look at it from a different uh, angle. What's the problem you're trying to solve? Mm -hmm. So rather than start with a couple of nations or three or four, what's the problem you're trying to solve? Who has equities in solving that problem? And then bring them under the tent. And then you know, then you got to work policy issues and how do you share some things you can share in greater depth, and realize that there's going to be, um, I won't say inequities, but certain ints you can share more than others. But I think really organizing yourself around the problem as opposed to uh, necessarily just nation relationships at that point uh, is a good way to start on the way ahead. But we've got to really push on a door that's somewhat open with regards to policy. But there still is a lot of risk aversion and a bit of a Cold War mindset uh, when it comes to bringing partners under the tent. But I think, Dave, you know, I think, David, we think always when we think about partnerships are international partnerships. But all of our partnerships here are also partnerships with, you know, industry, but also partnerships with academia. Mm -hmm. uh, I would tell you from personal experience, uh, we are trying to build a force, uh, a force for the future in science, technology, engineering, and mathematics that ensure that we are the leaders in the, in the tech world. You know, in 1990, 28% of our computer science graduates were women. You know, by 2000, it had dropped to 20%. Now it's at about 18%. And being able to address that, being able to address the fabric of the nation in terms of building that type of capacity, I'm sure touches, you know, NRO, it touches all of our intelligence agencies. But this is something that, you know, I would say that uh, is for us uh, incredibly important in our development of partnerships. If I could just jump on that piece, because that's a great point of bringing the industry into the discussion. And so the other thing that I ask you to do as you build those capabilities for us, mm -hmm. don't slap a no foreign at the end of that or something proprietary. Because as we think about how we operate, mm -hmm. how you provide incredible capability that enables us, we need to be interoperable with our partners. And so if we get something that is no foreign that we cannot share, that technology that becomes an extremely limiting factor in our ability to work at scale. Yeah, I'd like to add a bit about the uh, universities and the industries. I mean, that's really critical. Uh, from an NRO perspective, we're pretty good at acquiring talent. People want to work for us, which is great. Uh, but we want to have that pipeline and uh, the relationships with universities and uh, particularly the startup companies uh, but also the you know the major major corporations that are out there is absolutely critical to our success. If we're going to bring in new technology, new capabilities, stay ahead of our you know our great power competitors, we need to have that capability, and we need to draw not just from the United States but from around around the world in order to get that uh, that accomplished. So let, let me ask Mr. Abate about the difficult um, sort of other side of this coin. We want to be open to the world's uh, brightest people. We uh, want to use our universities as an open, creative source of innovation. 
Mr. Bate, the, the FBI is charged with making sure that our near-peer competitors, let's focus on China, uh, are not using our openness, the openness of our universities, our, our companies, the talent to steal vital national security information. So I, I, we all know that the FBI is more forward-leaning now in trying to talk to, to universities, talk to companies. <clears throat> if you could just give us a sense of, uh, first, the message that you want uh, those audiences to have uh, from the Bureau about being vigilant, uh, what you want them to do, and then also how you're trying in, in your work at the Bureau to avoid overdoing this. Yeah, I, it's, it's really coming together, um, again, in ways we haven't seen before. Um, we go out alongside partners and work. We've, put a real, we've done it for a long time in the academic world and uh, across private industry, providing defensive briefings, getting out uh, threat briefings, talking uh, with people in leadership and throughout those worlds. Um, I don't think it's always been taken seriously. Uh, one of the things we've seen with the focus on the impact on elections particularly, um, in the emergence of social media and the way hostile actors are taking advantage of that and the harm that's been done, it's really brought attention and focus on that publicly like never before. So we know that hostile foreign actors terrorist groups have used and leveraged and they've done, uh, employed these methods for ages. Um, I just don't think it's been well recognized broadly. And the good thing out of all of this, it's not good, but people are, the awareness level of the American people has been incredibly elevated over the past few years because of the bad things that have happened in the efforts on all of our parts, our organizations, to go out and talk about it publicly and spotlight it in ways that we probably weren't open to and had never done um, in the past and, and historically. Uh, and that's, a, that's a, a key piece of all of this. And protecting our country um, is educating the public about the threat um, and arming them with the tools and information they need to best protect themselves in the world in which they live, whether that's academic or whether it's in uh, private industry. Um, we have a number of initiatives uh, in, the, in the FBI. We have an Office of Private Sector now. We have an Office of Partner Engagement. We've invested in uh, people and the resources to go out uh, and do that more broadly and deeper than ever. And again, we're doing it in combination with our partners uh, uh, probably more broadly uh, than ever as well, and it, it's having an impact. And I think because of the public spotlighting of this and just the talk that's out there in the media, we're finding now people from those worlds are actually coming to us mm -hmm. much more so than being resistant to it as we've experienced to varying degrees um, in the past. So that's a very, very positive thing. And I think you know, working together is gonna position us even better to defend the country and our people uh, better than, than ever going forward. So there's a, a couple areas in the Defense Department, and this was a recognition from Secretary of Defense Mattis, who stood up the Protecting Critical Technologies Task Force because of all the intellectual property that was being lost through clear defense contractors. So that's one aspect of it. Mm -hmm. uh, the Hill was much more aggressive over the last year and a half on the CFIUS process to make it more aggressive. And then within the Defense Intelligence Agency, we have a a team that has representation from the services uh, that does supply chain risk management threat analysis center. So from a counterintelligence standpoint, do you understand what's behind the chip or behind a sub to a sub that put a, you know, a chip in, we'll say a surveillance camera for, the, for a good example of one that we found? Because in some cases you have a process called white labeling where you know, if, it's, if it's the Tish Long semiconductor company, she may not be the one that actually manufactures that. That goes back to some place in China, not that Tish would do that. And then she can actually sell it because she doesn't have all the infrastructure behind having to build that, but she can, she can push that forward as her product, and it's not illegal. So that kind of disclosure and understanding of your supply chain mm -hmm. is absolutely critical because when you get into the Internet of Things and cyber risks and the connectivity of mm -hmm. virtually, I mean, everything at this point, 
uh, if you, un you don't understand where every component to that system came from, mm -hmm. you're accepting risk. So there's a, a very interesting question from our audience that focuses on the supply chain issue, and I just want to read it, and then I'd welcome each of you have to think about the integrity of your supply chains, mm -hmm. so responses from anyone. The question uh, is, we've long known that China, North Korea, Russia, and other countries have tried to steal commercial technologies, but to what degree are they working to sabotage commercial supply chains? Given our adversaries' goals and capabilities, what sectors are most vulnerable, and how might successful sabotage affect the American economy? It's a great question. Mm -hmm. um, who can I enlist? General Naxoni, you think about supply chains a lot in your business? I begin with the idea of do we understand our supply chain? Uh, and I think that this is, you know, this question really points to what's the totality of knowledge? General Ashley talked uh, about some of the tactics and techniques that our adversaries use, but I think the big piece that I would add to that is where's the verification? And how do we have a mm -hmm. fully thorough understanding of being able to not only uh, understand, but also then verify the trust, confidential, confidentiality, and assurance of what's coming out of that. We spent a tremendous amount of time on that. Uh, and we've had, I would say, a, a, long, um, a long history of understanding how our adversaries can do that based upon what we've watched and then being able to apply that to our own defenses. <clears throat> any, any other thoughts about, about how to make sure that the supply chains are not um, sabotaged, to put it bluntly? We have to understand our supply chains all the way from the, the parts supplier, prime, and then all of their subs to, to make sure that we understand what's going into our systems. Uh, and that's a, a very hard task that we have to work with a lot of organizations to go off and do, and we need everybody to, to go off and work it. So it's a, it's a very critical, critical issue, particularly as, as General Ashley pointed out, you don't necessarily always know who built that part. So understanding the, the supply chain in detail is critical, but it's not just at the prime, it's at the subs. And also protecting the data that we develop in, in developing tools and capabilities mm -hmm. as we develop chips to make sure that that data is secure. So the intellectual property that we develop, our primes develop, um, our subs develop uh, is protected as well so that it's not copied and then falls into the supply chain. I think General Nakasone said an important word, uh, the verification on this. And we talked about some of the risks associated with technology and understanding your, your, uh, your supply chain and also your intellectual property. There's an ad added dimension of complexity to this that we need to collectively figure out, which is um, your verification, your valid validation of the accuracy of the information that you have especially as we define our partnerships more broadly and, and we actively go out to seek more sources of information to help us answer important questions, we're going to have to think through, we are thinking through on the geospatial realm, geospatial intelligence assurance. And how, do we, how do we build that in to making sure we are protecting um, the validity of our own process so that we can uh, verify the validity and the accuracy um, of the sources that we're bringing in. So, so part of it is, and again, and the contract is yet a vehicle. Mm -hmm. We've not looked at contracts in the sub to the sub in the, in the past to write the language in such a way that would preclude certain relationships with a foreign entity. Mm -hmm. So that's part of it. But as General Nakasini said, you, you got to validate and verify. Mm -hmm. I get all kinds of visits from my counterparts, which are absolutely, you know, tremendous engagements. But that's one of the topics, topics I talked to them about. Mm -hmm. I had a I had engagement this morning with one of my counterparts, and I said, hey, one of the areas I think that we can work with you, because you didn't bring it up, was counterintelligence and supply chain risk management. Mm -hmm. Because at some point, cross-domain solutions, and as much as you can protect your network, you're connecting into something that you didn't necessarily build yourself if you're bringing in other partners. So you got to have some degree of assurance in that as you're building those architectures. And so part of this is just education of your partners in general. Uh, to, to apply the same rigor that you do and how you build your networks and how you kind of verify uh, the material that goes inside those networks. Uh, ask uh, Mr. Abate to comment on something that um, we used to talk about. Uh, it was almost the exclusive subject of conversations uh, at a gathering like this. Now uh, it often is uh, almost uh, set aside. 
but it's reminded every day in some way it's, it's still with us, and that's terrorism. Uh, the, the FBI has um, done an extraordinary job over these last 15 plus years in dealing with uh, domestic uh, threats. You're now, from what we read, trying to broaden your lens a little bit so that we're not talking necessarily about foreign-inspired uh, terrorism, but terrorism that has some domestic uh, roots. Talk a little bit for this audience about how the Bureau is looking at the terrorism problem now uh, to the extent that you're changing how you allocate resources. Uh, give us a, a glimpse of that. I think it's in, starting out, it's important to say that all of us and our organizations represented here remain laser focused on countering terrorism, mm -hmm. period. Um, even with all the emerging threats and the hybrid threats <clears throat> and the complexity of the threats that are coming at us, which we've touched upon in part up here already, um, we've continued to keep the focus on countering terrorism and protecting people uh, from harm. Uh, and we're going to continue to do that. But <clears throat> like the counterintelligence world and nation state threats and the cyber threat, the terrorism threat is morphing and taking shape in ways that we haven't seen before uh, as well. We do categorize it in terms of international terrorism and domestic terrorism, and we approach it from that perspective in terms of prioritization and resourcing. Um, and we have seen a shift from the overseas foreign terrorist organization attempting and mounting large-scale, spectacular type attacks against traditional targets to the lone actor and the homegrown violent extremists here in the United States um, taking uh, singular action on a much smaller scale with very simple methods like cars and knives that are readily available um, every day. And we've had to shift uh, in that. And it's a growing problem and it's represented in the numbers we see in terms of the arrest and the disrupt disruptions and tragically the many attacks we've seen uh, as well. If we look just back over the past couple of years, uh, we've had in excess, both in international terrorism and domestic, in excess of 100 or so arrests where we were able to get in front of it collectively and neutralize uh, the, the individual before they actually committed an act of violence uh, against anyone. Um, but we're always focused on prevention. I um, mean, we've had too many sad and tragic events occur, um, particularly in the recent uh, times, and we're always working hard together to prevent that uh, from happening. Mm -hmm. And we're, we're coming together. Um, technology is a big part of that, uh, because when someone is la acting alone, the communications indicators that we might be monitoring or that would have given us the lead to a person in the past connecting them to a foreign terrorist organization or group is no longer there. We have people that are being radicalized individually and on their own, uh, you know, in their basement. And that's hard to spot uh, in advance. So we're having to work uh, more closely with our communities here in the United States. We found that um, positively we're getting a lot of reporting from people that are closest to those that may want to commit uh, acts of violence, family, friends, close associates, those in the best position to spot um, bad behavior uh, and bring it, bring it forward. So we're doing a lot of outreach in that regard uh, in order to bring those people forward and put us in the best position to stop that from happening uh, before, before it occurs. I want to ask about a, a technology question that's uh, it's vexing. Uh, that you think about, but really is one that's happening out in the private sector. Um, and that is the uh, reluctance of the employees of some of our biggest and best uh, technology companies, especially the ones in the AI space that we uh, most need as, as those technologies uh, move forward, the reluctance of those employees to work for the, for the U.S. government. The obvious headline example is the, the petition that was circulated among Google employees about Project Maven that ultimately led Google management to pull back from, from that. And I want to ask you to uh, just, it, it maybe in a few sentences, uh, as many of you as would like, just, just share with this audience what you would say 
to employees mm -hmm. at Google or anywhere else uh, on this question of why you and your, your company should be willing to work with the U.S. government uh, on these uh, technologies in key defense areas. General Nicholson, why don't you start? I think our chairman has said it best. Uh, he was very, uh, very succinct and very accurate. And he said, really, we have companies that don't want to work with us, but they're willing to share that technology with a nation that is developing an internet that's Orwellian in its approach to track their citizens. <laughs> it has not the same beliefs in terms of rule of law and an ability for freedoms. Is that really the future that uh, c members of this uh, company want to go for the future? I would offer, you know, for us, um, I think that's a very small population of, of people. Yeah. We deal with <clears throat> a number of different corporate partners every single day. Uh, that's not an issue that we have seen. Um, and I would just, you know, close by saying in, in, in this sense, you know, our employees, you know, have one single thing that shares commonality across all of our agencies. They share an oath to defend the Constitution. And that's a very powerful thing. And I think that that's among the things that I would certainly share with, with uh, employees of, of uh, companies that would say, hey, we don't, uh, we don't want to necessarily do business with you. Admiral Sharp, you and I were talking a little bit before yeah. about some of your own recent contacts with tech companies and their employees. Maybe you could share that with the audience. I'd, I'd uh, echo uh, General Nakasone's comment that that's, you know, from our experience, that's really kind of an outlier. And uh, we have... We have tremendous interaction with our industry base, and that's uh, large companies, defense, you know, with history working with defense to new startup companies across the board. We've made, you know, small investment with presence out in Silicon Valley, out in, in, uh, in an outpost, a small presence in Austin, Texas, just so we can uh, have dialogue with some of these, you know, companies. One, to help explain to them who we are and what we do, which I think is incumbent upon us to demystify our business, you know, so you get beyond these, um, we think the IC does this. You know, some of it is just us make, helping them understand um, the broad range of things we do. Um, it also creates an important dialogue to help them understand um, in meaningful ways the challenges that we're facing and where they might be able to apply something that they already have or are developing towards helping us um, solve our problems. So um, I do think that um, you know, we can work through these. We have strong relationships right now. And I'd also like to tell them it's really, really important um, to the success of, of protecting this nation um, and protecting uh, other nations like us around the globe. Yeah, well, actually, th this cannot be an unemotional topic, although you have to stay unemotional the way you explain it, and it's hard not to. Um, so for 35 years, 35 years, I get up every morning, and my task is to protect your hopes and dreams. Mm -hmm. That's my role. And I do it with every other sailor, soldier, airman, Marine, Coast Guardsman, civilian. That's my why. That's why I get up every morning. And it starts with my family. Mm -hmm. And so for somebody that says, you can't get on that that vector, that team, and support that cause. Um, and as General Naka City said, it is a small, small outlier because we've not ran into that. How would you not want to work to support the hopes and dreams of your family? Mm. Because at the end of the day, that's what it's about. That's sad. <laughs> One of the creative things that I've noticed that the Pentagon is uh, doing uh, is trying to involve the smartest um, people in the tech sector in developing what they're calling ethical AI. In other words, ways of drawing the community of the, the best and brightest into the discussion of what our rules are going to be, yeah. how we're going to do this, yeah. uh, General Ashley, uh, in the American way to be corny about it. Yeah, I mean, I think part of it is just helping them understand the problems we're trying to solve. Yeah. And, you know, I go back to the time when DDS was first stood up inside the Pentagon and Chris came on board and I was having a conversation uh, with one of the seniors and I said, so how can we afford him? She said, he's post-econ. His money is not an issue. He's here about solving problems for the nation. And yeah. so I think that's part of the, uh, the proposal we want to make with industry is, we have some very hard problems, 
we absolutely need your support to solve them. And we're solving them on behalf of the nation. And so that's why we want to bring you on board and help us do that, because we can't do it without you. Mm -hmm. So I have a couple of uh, questions about space for <clears throat> Dr. Scalise and Admiral Sharp, and I, I'll bet there are a lot of people in the audience who'd love to hear the answers to these. Uh, the first is, so much geoint data, data is available from commercial sources. Mm -hmm. Does the U.S. government have a future in geoint, or should we rely principally on commercially available information? Um, that's one question, and then I'm going to read you the other, and then ask you to, to, um, to comment. Um, we have long leveraged intelligence from space. How, unfortunately this does, is obscuring part of the question, but how, basically, how do we get intelligence for space operations? We've seen it as a platform for getting information. We've got to operate up there now. It's a military domain. How are we going to do that? So if you could address those two questions. Admiral Sharp, maybe you could start off with the GEOINT question. Yeah, I'll, I'll start by the, the short answer is yes, there's absolutely um, you know, mission space for, for government and the intelligence community to continue to be involved in geospatial intelligence realm. And it's, it's because uh, everything happens somewhere in space and time, right? And, and we need the wherewithal to make sense out of it as it relates to space and time some from a baseline just so we can, we can operate safely to get from point A to point B, right? By understanding the, the, uh, the Earth, its physical characteristics from seabed to space, you know, so that you can start to under, uh, overlay um, understanding uh, of what's happening where and make sense out of it to help answer questions from policymakers to warfighters um, to first responders. Um, where I see us going with this investment that's coming from commercial industry in this, in this realm is just, you know, a great partner opportunity for us. So what we need to do is be looking as good stewards of U.S. dollars, you know, where we can leverage other people's investments to help us answer questions that we need to and where we need to focus our efforts so that we can uh, answer those questions that aren't being answered. Um, or so that we can make sense out of data faster than potential competitors. Um, you know, in the military, we're, we're fond to talk about the OODA loop, observing, orienting, deciding, acting. Um, former chief of naval operations would, would uh, often say, hey, our comparative advantage historically has been in observing faster than any competitors out there. That's becoming more of a level playing field we need to figure out how we're going to orient, decide, and act and make sense out of data. Um, and I think there's a big play for, for government, for military, for the intelligence community to, be, to continue to be involved in that. And I, I think I hear you saying uh, over time to give up some of the things that you used to do because you don't have to do them anymore. You can buy them. Yeah. You can, you can buy different sources. You can buy services that are available out there. And once again, you know, if you look at the broad range of customers that we serve, um, it's, it's uh, anywhere from government policy makers to uniformed individuals, strategic operational tactical level. It's also um, other government agencies. You know, we were mentioning the humanitarian and dis assistance disaster relief mission going in response to Dorian. You know, we need to be able to uh, provide uh, information, geospatial information to a broad range of customers. Some of that is going to be available to us from commercial sources. Some of that we're going to have to create ourselves and we're going to have to disseminate it where and when needed on a broad, at a broad range of classification levels. Um, Dr. Scalise, yeah. yeah. So I was going to say that um, uh, Admiral Sharp's exactly right. I mean, we should buy what's available. If, if somebody is providing it and it meets the requirements that we need, uh, it, in, it allows us to focus on what's not being done, what's mm -hmm. necessary to be done, and that's, that's where we try and, and work, you know, all the time, to assure that we're getting the best product to the intelligence analyst and the warfighter as quickly as possible, uh, because it's timeliness of the data that's really critical in today's world. Um, so, yes, we have to work with all pieces of the of the supply chain, if you will, 
for uh, uh, information about the Earth. Some people wouldn't call it intelligence uh, mm -hmm. information. Um, to, to make it available so that we can use it as quickly as possible, develop as resilient and as strong a system as we can. So yes, we're gonna buy what's, what's out there, we're gonna use what's out there when it makes sense, when it meets our requirements, when it meets the requirements of, of the people here and, and in, uh, in the broader intelligence and defense community. And then we're gonna develop those things that we absolutely need and are not being provided. Yeah. And that sort of answers, in a way, your question about the, the, force the space. The question was, was interesting. We're, we're, we use space as a platform for, for collection down below, but you know, we need to think about collection in, yep. in the, the domain that is space. I'm yep. sure you're thinking about that and probably most of what you're thinking you can't tell us, but um, uh, is there anything that, you, that you'd wanna briefly say about that? I think, you know, both using space and ground to find out what's threatening space as we look at uh, more and more countries developing ASAT capabilities and, and other threats is something that we have to be very much aware of. Uh, that's one of the reasons that the NSDC has been set up and why there's such a strong partnership between the Space Command and, and NRO is to understand those threats. Uh, utilize all the resources that are available, space-based, ground-based, uh, terrestrial-based, I should say, uh, in order to, uh, to address the threat and be able to uh, mitigate it. So if I could add to that, one of the things that we put out at an unclassified level was a publication called Challenges in Space. And when the Undersecretary of Defense for Intelligence said, hey, we'd like you to look at what can we talk about great powers in terms of their um, ASAT, lasers, co-orbital, all those things. What, what can we put out in the public domain for, for Congress, for senior leaders to be able to bring that into a public dialogue? And uh, our director of analysis and I, we thought, okay, that'll be a trifold. There's not a whole lot we can share. Uh, actually, what we produced was a 30-page document, and we laid out a significant amount of the capability for Russia, China, Iran, and the DPRK. We laid out challenges in space. So the things you talked about, whether it's ASAT, lasers, co-orbitable, uh, jamming, electronic warfare, uh, all that is at the unclassified level, a lot of information that we could put in the public domain to start that dialogue to understand the nature of that threat. So we've come to the end of, of our hour, uh, and um, I want to just say to my panelists, um, you are operating in, uh, in the, the most interesting, but also the most sensitive uh, areas of our government. Uh, it's wonderful when you're all willing to come here and, uh, and, and share your views about what goes on in your agencies. I really appreciate the chance to, to be with all of you. Thank you. Thank you, David. Yeah. <laughs>
industry, and academia that are absolutely critical to successfully meeting today's and tomorrow's threats and challenges. And I dare say, we had a lot of good dialogue this last day and a half. So thank you for joining us. We hope to see you next week at our classified session. And save the dates, our 2020 summit, hot off the press, September 17 and 18, right here. Everybody be safe going home. Join us at the happy hour if you can. And again, a big round of applause to our last panel.